For over 10 years, we at Climate One have been engaging policymakers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. You're the man. Come on okay. up. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us on this. Very exciting. This is our signature event of the year. We're very excited to have Dr. Bullard here. Um, before we begin today's conversation, I'd like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Coast Miwok people who inhabited Bay Area lands here for 10,000 years. I'm Greg Dalton. In 2007, I went to the Arctic on a global warming expedition with scientists and journalists aboard an icebreaker. Experiencing climate change at the top of the world changed my life, and when I returned, created Climate One here at the Commonwealth Club. For the last 12 years, I've been interviewing leaders about how burning fossil fuels disrupts all of the systems around us. Our food system, our water system, our ecosystems, our lifestyle, and our economy. Climate changes everything. Today, we're honoring a revered champion of people in a respectful and inclusive relationship with our environment. Dr. Robert Bullard is Distinguished Professor of Urban Planning and Environmental Policy at Texas Southern University. He's the author of 18 books that address sustainable development, environmental racism, urban land use, climate justice, disasters, smart growth, regional equity, and more topics. His titles include Race, Place, and Environmental Justice After Hurricane Katrina, and my favorite, the Wrong Complexion for Protection, How the Government Responds to Disaster Endangers African American Communities. Dr. Bullard is highly decorated. In 2014, Sierra Club named its new Environmental Justice Award after him. In 2019, a political named him one of the world's 100 most influential people in climate policy. He's the co-founder of the Climate Change Consortium of Historically Black Colleges and Universities and a proud U.S. Marine Corps veteran. Ooh, ah. <laughs> Please give Dr. Robert Bullard a warm San Francisco welcome. Thank you. Well, welcome. Uh, Dr. Bullard, I was reading uh, your book, Wrong Complexion for Protection, and you did something quite unusual in the beginning of your book. Uh, you thanked your ex-wife. Um, so tell us what she did, she drafted you into. So tell us what you, uh, how she got you into this. <laughs> well, well, first of all, uh, uh, two years out of graduate school, uh, I uh, got drafted into working on a case that she had filed. And it was a lawsuit that... Uh, challenged the location of uh, municipal landfills, sanitary landfills in Houston, Texas. And I came home one day and she said, Bob, uh, I just sued uh, the state of Texas. Now I worked for a state university. I said, y you, s you did what? You, you sued my employer. <laughs> now, no tenure. Uh, she said, I, I, I need somebody to collect uh, data for this suit because we, I just filed, uh, I, need a, I need to get a, a temporary restraining order and stop this company from locating this landfill in the middle of this predominantly black middle class suburban community. I need somebody that can uh, gather this data and put it on a map and so I can go into court and fight for this community. And I said, um, you need a sociologist. She said, that's what you are, right? <laughs> Before that, she knew I left home and, and uh, went to work Tuesday, Thursday, came back, but she never knew what I did. And I said, yeah, that's what sociologists do. And so that's how I, <laughs> that's how, it was accidental. So I see myself in that way as an accidental sociologist. This is before there was 
a term of environmental justice, environmental racism, whatever. Uh, and so it was a, a case challenging the location of municipal landfill that, was, that we found as, that were disproportionately located in African-American communities in a city that doesn't have zoning. Uh, we found that, and I had 10 students in my research methods class, and I told my students, I said, students, we have a research project. And I said, uh, they asked me what it is. I said, it's a study of where all the landfills, incinerators, garbage dumps are located in Houston, and we need to find out uh, where they are. And that's our project. And they, our students looked at me and said, OK. And that's how I did it. And we'll get to some other uh, <laughs> landfills and uh, siting. I'll just do a quick adjustment there. Um, we'll get to some other landfills and siting uh, of uh, those sorts of things later, and Houston again later. But you grew up in Elba, Alabama, about 80 miles uh, south of Montgomery, a region that gave rise uh, to the civil rights movement, of course, you know, Rosa Parks in Montgomery. So tell us about the connection between kind of you growing up in the very fertile region of the civil rights movement and getting it, and then how that connects to your work with environmental justice. Well, you know, I grew up in an era where everything was segregated in the South. You know, I went to an all-black elementary school, middle school, high school. Uh, uh, I, had, I never had a white teacher until I went to Iowa State University, worked on a PhD. Uh, I, my undergraduate university was, was all-black, uh, Alabama A&M University. So I grew up in an era where civil rights and fighting for justice was, uh, was the same in voting and, and young people and students. And I, I was part of that, you know, that student um, movement. And so my parents and grandparents, you know, they were strong supporters of voting. Now, I didn't see myself, you know, growing up as an environmentalist, but in terms of, of um, growing up where having gardens and having uh, this, this whole idea of, of not uh, wasting things and, and being creative with the little that you have. I didn't grow up, quote, impoverished or anything. You know, we had uh, a little money because my great-grandparents actually was able to uh, get uh, 550 acres of timberland in 10 years after slavery. We don't know how they got it, but we know they got it. Uh, and that's how <laughs> my parents were able to, um, to sell the timber uh, every six or seven years to send all my uh, uh, siblings to college. And so I was very aware of the environment in terms of outdoors and and, and trees and, and nature, uh, but it was not, I guess, rooted in this whole idea of modern environmentalism. But for you, that those logging was a source of uh, advancement. Did you have, was there? I'm just curious about that. Having you know, logging actually put you through school. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. That the connection there between trees as a source of revenue versus balancing them for, the, for some environmental purpose. Yeah, yeah. And, and the whole idea of being outdoors, my, my dad hunted and fished. Um, he was a member of, I won't call the name, that they've named an award after. Be, we couldn't join, uh, uh, black folks couldn't join the Sierra Club. It was allowed, uh, in Alabama, it was a private club. But he hunted, fished. Did not know that. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Well, uh, huh. Jim Crow, there's a reason huh. they call the South Dixie. Um, uh, but again, the, the idea of uh, being outdoors and having rivers that, that were clean and pristine and because um, my parents, when, uh, my, my dad mostly fished, uh, he was not an angler. It, it wasn't uh, catch and release, it was catch and bring home, <laughs> clean and eat. Uh, and so, the, so, so that, that idea was, was all instilled. And so it was not, as I said, the whole idea of being, of how, how environmentalism was defined. We're not members of, of uh, organizations that, um, that had environment in their names, but we were concerned about the environment. We worked on environmental issues in, uh, in a way that, that, uh, that went unnoticed. It was not until, you know, Earth, first Earth Day, for example, in 1970, um, April, I was in, I was, in the Marine Corps, and, um, and there was a war going on, I, it called Vietnam, and so I was not 
you know, at the first Earth Day. Uh, but it did not mean that I was not, you know, concerned about environmental issues. Um, there were other issues that were like civil rights and voting, et cetera, that, was, that had high priority. More but breathing also had a, had a good uh, priority also. <laughs> More immediate and personal. Um, I learned in, in your book uh, that Dr. King was called to Memphis in 1968, and I, we all know that, but I, I bet a lot of people don't know why Dr. King was in Memphis in 1968. Tell us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. King was called to Memphis uh, in support of striking uh, sanitation workers. And uh, if you don't think uh, garbage is uh, an environmental issue, you let the garbage workers go on strike. And uh, as a matter of fact, in 68, they had to call out the National Guard uh, to pick up the garbage. And Dr. King was assassinated in April before he could finish his, finish his job. And uh, of course, I was in, in April 1968, I, I was uh, a senior in college. Uh, and of course, devastated. That's a long time ago, but you think about it, it's not that long ago. Mm. We think about um, uh, this whole idea of, of civil rights and environmental rights and for the last you know 25 30 40 years to get civil rights and environmental rights to converge uh, it took a lot of work and convincing our environmental brothers and sisters organizations but also it took a lot of convincing of folks on civil rights to work on these issues with the same fervor that they brought to, to uh, uh, civil rights and human rights and it finally occurred with the convergence uh, into what we call environmental justice. And uh, in the late 1970s, 1979, a seminal moment in that uh, conversion, Congress banned PCBs in 1979, and there was an effort to find a dump, basically, for these toxic carcinogenic, uh, carcinogenic chemicals, and a spot was identified in Warren County, North Carolina, a new landfill, uh, and that, in some ways, is there's sort of the creation story of environmental justice. So tell us what happened there. And you worked with uh, Benjamin Chavis, who played a key role in that. Well, Dr. Chavis led the struggle in Warren County um, in 1978 when, they, when this company from, uh, from New York uh, came down to Raleigh and wanted to uh, recycle uh, this oil. And... The, they find out that the oil that they were going to recycle had been contaminated with PCBs. And since they couldn't recycle it because of the law, they dumped it along the highways. And, and then they cleaned it up. Then they needed a place to put this contaminated uh, dirt, dirt. And so uh, they went through this rigorous process of selecting the most sci uh, scientifically suitable place and... Of course, there was no science. The only science involved was political science. And when they opened the envelope, the winner was Warren County, one of the poorest and one of the blackest counties in the, in the state. And uh, Dr. Chavis and the uh, United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice and the NAACP and, and the communities uh, in Warren County said no. And uh, Dr. Chavis coined the term environmental racism. That this is environmental racism. And over 500 people were arrested. You know, 1970, uh, 1983, um, it, it was a pivotal year in that, you know, uh, Dr. Chavis and the commission got the, uh, the general county officers to do a study on what was happening in the South. They found out 75% of the hazardous waste facilities in the South were located in black communities, even though blacks only made up 20% of the population. And, and so the idea of, of this national movement uh, gaining steam out of Warren County uh, and that there were isolated uh, struggles going on all across the country, even the one in Houston and other places across the country. But Warren County put the issue on the map and people put their bodies uh, in streets, high school kids laying prone trying to stop these dump trucks and people arrested and, and the continuous uh, sustained struggle, people saying no, no, no. And this is when uh, uh, the, the environmental justice movement came together uh, and people started to identify with that struggle. And uh, so that was a shot heard around the world, Warren County. And it was the United Church of Christ that played a, and so there was, which I, 
you know, what's the racial complexion of the United Church of Christ? Well, the, the United Church of Christ is a white denomination, but the Commission for Racial Justice was a black civil rights organization based in the church, faith, uh, faith-based uh, group in the church. And the, the whole concept of, of merging uh, uh, civil rights and environmental rights uh, and the faith community, that was something that uh, emerged out of uh, the civil rights movement, of struggling, a struggle against um, uh, injustice, whether it was housing, voting, education, it now had basically been pushed into the right to live in a clean, healthy environment where, where you don't get uh, dumped on just because of the color of your skin or, or the amount of money you make. That was novel. Uh, and to, uh, you would think it would be commonplace, you know, since everybody breathes the air and drinks water and eat food, you would think that that would be something that was uh, uh, real and not aspirational. We don't decide on Tuesday we're not going to breathe. So it's like uh, this is something that should be basic. And it took the, the church and moral leadership to help kind of fuse that, put that in a moral frame. Yes, it did. And, and the idea that young people uh, uh, got out of school and cut classes. This is 1983, 82, and, and basically the, said The height no. of Reaganism. Hmm? The, I mean, the, the, the peak of Ronald Reagan. Yes, yeah. yes. And so when you talk about this whole idea of, of social movements and the role that young people and students have, have played, every social movement that has been successful in this country has ha- had a strong youth and student component. You know, back in Warren County, with that birth of the environmental justice movement, the civil rights movement, peace and justice, women's movement, and right now, the climate movement. You look at young people and what they're doing, what they're saying, they're owning these issues, and they're saying, no, we don't have to wait until we can vote to be uh, mindful of the fact that we are destroying this earth and we're on the wrong direction, and we have to do something about uh, climate crisis. And so the youth involvement, Greta Thunberg and others, is really one of the breakthrough stories of, of 2019. Of course, she was just recognized as Time Person yeah. of the Year. So how do you see that? When you see the youth getting involved, striking, you know, we've had people here on this stage, you know, people who are 12, 13, yeah. 14, skipping school every Friday, sometimes with their parents' consent, saying, you've got a calling, you, this is bigger than your yeah. grades, bigger than... Uh, so what's your, your feeling when you see those youth? You're like, oh, finally they're here. Well, it, it reminds me of, of us in the 60s who we were fearless. We weren't afraid of going to jail. We weren't afraid of, of basically people saying, well, you're going to get a C. Uh, <coughs> well, you know, having a C and can't breathe is what's the, what's the purpose. And so the idea that there's, there's a calling that you have to say, no, we have to change. And those with the most energy... Uh, who can you think of other than young people? They have lots of energy. And so we have to have this intergenerational movement struggle uh, for justice. And, and I'm biased. You know, I am for justice. <laughs> <laughs> Environmentalism has often been a bipartisan issue in this country. You know, certainly... Uh, President Nixon was, was, uh, would be a radical environmentalist by, t- by today's standards. In, in 19, the first President Bush, uh, I learned from you, was surprised, actually created the first Office of Environmental Equity mm-hmm. in the EPA. Now tell us about that creation and, and, and why. <laughs> well, you know, the, um, the, the creation of that office was um, the impetus for, uh, that followed a conference that was organized uh, by uh, uh, Paul Mohai and Bunyan Bryant at the University of Michigan, where, where they basically pulled together a few of us, a few academics, and you could almost uh, fit them on one hand, that were working on, this is 1991, uh, working on environmental uh, uh, justice. And they had a conference at the University of Michigan, race and the incidents of environmental hazards. And a few governmental people EPA was there and some, uh, some community people. And after the conference was such a great conference. He said, we need to write um, the EPA and, and the President's Council in, um, on Environmental Quality and Health and Human Services and, and ask for an audience with them. And we got an audience with EPA, with William Riley, and we had a sit-down. Uh, William Riley was, the, um, was an environmentalist. 
a conservationist. He came and directed the EPA, a Republican. So he, after we met with him, he made a commitment. We'd had a conference calls every quarter, every three, is that a quarter, three months? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so he made a commitment to us that he would make some changes inside of the EPA, and he created the Office of Environmental Equity. Now, we wanted the Office of Environmental Justice. We said, we're not asking for equity. Equity means, uh, in some people's mind, meant, meant that we were talking about uh, spreading the poison uh, equally. No, we said, no, that's not equity. That's madness. We said, we want justice, no community to be, um, to be poisoned. So he created this office, and, they, and then he produced the first national report on environmental justice. The report was entitled Environmental Equity, Reducing Risk for All Communities. They still were, they were afraid of justice uh, for some reason. Uh, and, but, but equity was a, was a softer term. We say, you can call that title anything you want, but we know what we want from our, um, from our justice communities uh, around the country. And then they had a definition. They define environmental uh, justice, and then they define uh, just treatment. You know, the government has to define anything before they can do anything. <laughs> well, I uh, invited William Riley to come here tonight, and he sent, it, sent his regrets. Uh, but in regards to you, yeah. uh, he would like to be here tonight. Um, you're receiving the Stephen Schneider Award for Climate Communication. Stephen Schneider was a fearless communicator, and he was in the natural sciences, but he had a unique, I think, understanding of the, na of the he was in the in natural sciences, had a unique understanding. He talked to economists and social scientists, uh, cross-disciplinary communication, which was fairly rare in the climate world back back then. Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on the importance of kind of communicating the science and sociology and kind of uh, the different disciplines speaking about climate, which is seen kind of as a atmospheric, far away issue, at least it has been. You know, I think, I think the idea of climate change and this whole issue of the science and how we communicate uh, that science and to uh, expand uh, what it means when we talk about a climate crisis, uh, a global warming, a climate change, that climate change has to be defined more than parts per million and more than greenhouse gases. When we talk about communities that are on the front line, we talk about the most impacted, we talk about the, um, we talk about the economic um, uh, uh, consequences, and we talk about the health effects. We talk about the whole idea of, of communities that, uh, that, that will somehow culturally disappear. And when we, when we uh, define and communicate that uh, outward, then we have more people that will come to the table and say, oh, I understand what you're talking about. I am, you know, talk, you know we don't ask people to believe. Uh, you know, it's not a belief. You know, it's like asking people, do you believe in gravity? Jump off a 12-story building. <laughs> uh, so when we talk about communicating, you know, the, the, the issues, I think we have to be uh, multilingual when it comes to different disciplines. You know, I've written 18 books in, on transportation, housing, you know, on food security, on disasters, and, and they got catchy titles, but it's just, it's 18, book, it's 18 books, but it's just one book. Don't tell anybody, <laughs> but it's, the thing that holds those books together is fairness, justice, and equity. And when you look at climate, and look at the fairness, justice, and equity with the science part, you can see how the justice part, uh, that's the policy. And that's how we are to start addressing this because you know, we could have, you know, deal with climate change in one little corner of the, of the, of the earth and not deal with all these other uh, uh, equitable or inequity and still not address the total picture locally as well as globally. And so what I've tried to do is, is, is when we talk about climate change and we talk about these other issues, how we bring in economics. We bring in transportation, energy. You know, I wrote a book called Just Transportation. Dismount, yeah, Just Transportation. Get it? <laughs> and, but the idea <laughs> is, and I wrote another book called, that dealt with transportation, it's called Highway Robbery. <laughs> so if you look at, you know, both of those deal with energy mobility, um, they deal with issues of infrastructure. And so when you start defining and bringing in the climate piece, you're talking about energy, you're talking about transportation, you're talking about infrastructure, you're talking about jobs, you're talking about access to opportunity, all those things. 
And, so I, and we used to get, well, are you talking about social issues? We, we deal with environment. I won't call any names. We don't deal with environment. It was one of, the, one of the books I wrote. I sent a manuscript, and I said, oh, your organization's been around since Teddy Roosevelt. And the 1880s, I said, it's time for, I'm going to call names, because I got an award named after me. I said, Sierra Club, I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, it's time for Sierra Club to do a real book. The Sierra Club do great coffee table books. Now that, now, that was a jab. I said, it's time to do a book about justice, fairness, equity, about people, communities on the front line. And my response was, well, well that's true. Do you have anything? I had an outline in my pocket. <laughs> Gave it to him. And he said, wow, this looks great. I already had all 14 chapters ready. Ready to box up. You have to do what you have to do, and you have to bring organizations, bring the idea of justice, fairness, and equity, even some of the smartest people along. Because sometimes people are only thinking in their own way of thinking. And so what, in communicating out, you try to bring those people in a, in, in a, in a I guess, a way that they can see how things work. And the word for today is intersectionality. Intersectionality how things connect, and how you can make sure that people understand those connections. It's like connecting the dots. It's like kids work. You know, we, as a kid, used to connect the dots. That's what we're doing. Did you ever think that uh, the environmental justice conversation would be as prominent and front and center as it is right now? Because it really has come to the center of the climate conversation recently, and I think quite quickly. Did that surprise you? Did you expect that? Uh, sh short answer, no. <laughs> no, it's a surprise. I mean, it's, it's really surprising because of, of uh, the skepticism and the cynicism and the denial that, you know, that was so prevalent um, decades ago. And to see our framing uh, be an integral part of various um, subject matters, whether it's sustainability and, again, uh, uh, Julian Adjaman and uh, Bob Evans and I wrote a book called Just Sustainability. <laughs> Just Sustainability, Development in an Unequal World. You understand that you, in, if you talk about sustainability without justice, you're not really talking sustainability. So, so, to, so to see the environmental justice lens and framing be incorporated into uh, so many areas, even at, you know, even at the cop conferences, I mean, climate justice, that's a central core, and globally. And so we can't just say, well, uh, we don't do uh, that, that's social. We get some of that, but not as much as uh, we used to get. And so climate, the framing of climate justice, environmental justice, health equity, transportation justice, um, parks justice, food justice, food justice, food security. So justice, you just hang justice after all of the books I've written. Same thing. And you work on movements, you put justice in front or after, that's where I think we're going to be making the greatest uh, uh, contributions in, in terms of going forward. Our guest today at Climate One is Dr. Robert Bullard. I'm Greg Dalton. We're going to invite uh, Adriana Contero to come up and join us. Uh, we're going to bring another seat up here for her and ask her to join the conversation. Um, Adriana is the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Energy Foundation, which distributes about $100 million in grants a year. She's a friend of, of Climate One. So please welcome uh, Adriana. Thank you. So Adriana, you were working at a large environmental organization uh, on litigation, and at some point you felt kind of uncomfortable with the inclusiveness of that large organization. So tell us about how you felt like you weren't quite treated as an equal there and what you did about it. Yeah, well, when I uh, started in the movement, uh, I started as an attorney and pretty quickly realized we were working on pesticides litigation. And so it was very obvious to me that there should be some Latino farm workers represented in these cases. And while they were referenced and we were talking about them, 
we weren't talking to them. There was not that connection, at least in what, and we were doing the litigation. So for, for me, that was a, a clear disconnect and something that needed to be addressed. Fortunately, I was working with a really uh, amazing lawyer who's very committed to environmental justice to this day. And he just basically said, you're right, let's go do it. Let's go and start figuring this out. And that began my journey um, to, to try and, and to really learn. I had to educate myself. I did not come to this work knowing all the history and this wonderful work that people like Dr. Bullard had done and the environmental justice movement had done. So for me, it was really a learning journey to see and try and make sense of the disconnect, which to this day, I... Um, have trouble understanding how we got there, how we got here, yeah. how we got to the point where the environmental movement really lost touch with the humanity and, and the communities that were most impacted. And um, it just continues to, to motivate me every day. Dr. Bullard, I'm a believe, big believer that business models drive a lot of organizational behavior and a lot of environmental groups uh, rely on upper income, coastal elites to write checks uh, to fund their organization. Um, in 1991, you were part of a group of people who wrote to the t big 10 environmental groups and said, you're not, uh, I think you even wrote an article saying, can Houston be green if it's not brown or black? Has it got that right? So um, <laughs> yeah. tell us about, you know, our environmental groups, you said the Sierra Club wouldn't allow black people. Are they afraid of race because of their funders? Well, you know, I don't want to go into anybody's head. I'm a uh, sociologist, not a psychologist. But I do know that um, if an organization, a green organization, does not uh, look at the changing demographics of this country and, and start to, uh, I wouldn't say color coordinate, but at least <laughs> um, color coordinate and diversify, <laughs> then they're going to find themselves uh, uh, losing memberships or, or whatever. What we have found over the years is that when we organized the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in 1991, uh, and, and under the auspices of the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice and Dr. Chavis, um, we, we basically said that people of color uh, must be in the room, must, and communities on the front line must have a voice at the table. And what, when we had those four-day summit, we said that we will develop out of this summit, organizing principles. And when, group, when people went back home, many of them organized grassroots organizations and started networks, et cetera. And what we said is that we will press um, uh, and pressure uh, the green groups to, um, to uh, become more diverse in terms of their boards and their staffs and, and agendas. But that would not be the driver uh, at the forefront of our movement. Our movement is to make sure that those communities of color that, have, that are faced with many challenges when it comes to the environment uh, need to have their organization, their institutions funded at the level that's commensurate with the problem. Because if we could, if we somehow keep funding the same groups and we keep, you know, add one or two persons to the board, what I call the whom syndrome, W-H-O-M, uh, we have one minority. If we start using that, for that, uh, <laughs> that principle, the money will still flow and you'll have a whom uh, on a board and that still won't solve the problem of our organization of color that are underfunded. We can do both. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We must diversify the organization, but we also must diversify the funding. Can I get a hand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Adriana Quintero, you work for an organization that funds about $100 million, which is relatively small in the big world of philanthropy, but there have been studies done that show that the, the lion's share of philanthropy goes to the big national organization, which are predominantly white. Um, have philanthropists done a good job to Dr. Colleen, responding to Dr. Bullard's that call? No, and I would go ahead and also answer and add to the, the answer that Dr. Bullard so well, so put so well, I think there has been a discomfort with talking about race. There has been a discomfort with facing, looking in the mirror and realizing that big changes need to be made. And when things appear, appear, and I really emphasize appear to be working, it's even harder. But working for who, right? 
or whom <laughs> we're in, right <laughs> but no really work how are they truly working and i think it's taken far too long uh, at least as long as i've been in the movement to come to that realization that now we're seeing philanthropists realize we really missed the boat on this it's it, we're we're so far beyond time to really get close and 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 just take the spotlight off of the off of the white groups and look at the communities that are facing these problems every single day because what where is the knowledge more rich than there and i think this overreliance on science and data really dulled us i think for a long time and 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 drew us away from the stories which is really what motivates people and motivates change and i think that's why uh, to your point earlier why we're seeing so much movement is because that energy is driven by the story yeah. and and so i'm heartened to start to see the change now but we didn't have to wait this long Dr. Abreem X. Kendi is the founding director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University. His latest book is called How to Be an Anti-Racist. At the Commonwealth Club recently, Kendi was asked how we can talk about racism and anti-racism in a way that helps people understand where they fall. It's not who a person is. It is what a person is doing in that moment. And people change. And so people, when, when we're talking about health care, they can speak from an anti-racist perspective. But then when we talk about criminal justice, they, they think that black people are dangerous. But then when we talk about education, they believe that inequities stem from resource inequities. They, but then when we start talking about climate change, they're like, what climate change, right? It's not affecting the global south more than the global north, right? And so ultimately, people are distinct when it comes to different issues. But then also, even on the same issues, even in the same speech, even in the same paragraph of the same speech, people can say both racist and anti-racist things. That was Abram X. Kendi, professor and author of the recent book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. So uh, Dr. Bullard, your response there, that people can kind of move in and out of that place based on the issues they're addressing. Yes, exactly. And, and I, I think uh, when we talk about race, it's very difficult for some people to talk about race. They, sh they shut down. And so just like the concept of justice, justice, uh, when we're talking about justice at the EPA, you know, back in 91, th they saw that as threatening. And so in some cases, when you say, well, no, we want justice. Um, justice means going back, looking at some of the things that uh, uh, distributive kinds of, of, of challenges and, and policies that, that have legacy issues that go back. Uh, and and so, so, so when we talk about race and racism and and when the, um, when the environmental justice groups wrote that letter to the Big Ten um, back in 91, uh, not the football Big Ten, the, the, <laughs> the green groups, they were called Big Tens for your youngsters out there back, way back when, um, uh, a lot of the groups got offended. How dare? They said, well, look at your boards. All white. They said, yeah. They said, look at your staff. All white. Yeah. Look at your, your, your agendas. Yeah. So we're not calling you racist. We're just saying what you're doing is not... In, working in, in our behalf, and they said, well, mm. then some of them said, well, because all the green groups are not, uh, it's not broad brush, they're different, just like the environmental justice groups, different. They said, well, you know, we're going to make some changes, we're going to go forward, and some of them did. Some of them said, well, how dare you call us racist, uh, we don't want any part of you. And so you see some of that, and so you can look at that, that um, trajectory of who has been out front moving things and trying to address things and trying to reach out and trying to um, you know, bring in partners and coalitions and alliances and et cetera, and, 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 and who has not. And I'm not gonna call any names, uh, but I could. <laughs> uh, and, but I don't have to. If you're engaged with some, some of these organizations, some of these groups, we had to fight our oldest civil rights organization, not calling any names, but you know the initials. We had to fight them because they said, we don't work on environmental issues. And we say, are, are you concerned about black people breathing? <laughs> and then but it took 20 years for, the, for our mainstream civil rights organization to get on board with these issues of environmental justice because they were saying, 
Oh, you're trying to shut down jobs. We say no. We want people to have good jobs, safe, um, in terms of the workplace and fence line community. We want the fence line community to be safe as well as, well as the workers. When we start explaining to them what we were talking about, then they say, oh, we get it. And so, as I said, that convergence of, of conservation uh, environmental groups and our civil rights, human rights groups on two different tracks. So, so and, I, and what we say, this needs to converge when we talk about access to clean air and clean water, um, uh, a, a, cr a clean space, having schools that are not fence lined with a refinery. Who, who in their right mind would do something like that? We say, we know who happens, and you don't have to go very far, Richmond, or you go or the South Bay, or in Houston. You know, Cesar Chavez High School is across from one of the largest refineries. We know who goes to Cesar Chavez High School. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. <laughs> so, so unpacking um, that kind of injustice, and when it's racism, call it for what it is. Don't run from it. And as I said, all injustice is not racism. It took us almost 10 years for the people in Appalachia, or Appalachia, whichever you want to call it, uh, to understand that, that we're not, we were not calling all in environmental injustice racism. And they were, a lot of the whites in Appalachia were, were, were somewhat hesitant about working with us because they were thinking that we were talking about racism all the time. We said, no, mountaintop removal, contaminating your water, contaminating your air, making people sick, we will fight just as hard for you to get and keep clean air, clean water, and safety in your neighborhoods, et cetera, as we would in Mississippi and, or in Louisiana or Texas. It took 10 years for the people to understand that because many of them couldn't get past the fact that black folks and brown folks and people of color were leading this movement. See, there's this, this, this whole idea that some white people can't fathom the fact that black people and people of color and indigenous people are out front ahead of a lot of the very smart organizations who have PhDs at their heads and engineers and environmental scientists at their head when it took them 20 years to understand what we we're talking about. And we were, talk and we were writing and speaking in English. <laughs> well, you, would you help me get the head of the NAACP and Sierra Club to sit down together here in these chairs? I would love to. I mean, it would be easy. It's, it's like uh, they got, they got uh, uh, cell phones and, <laughs> and <laughs> email, Twitter. Yeah. And the idea, as I said, the idea of talking about these issues and coming together on these issues, and some of that is happening right now as we speak because... You know, sometimes when you sleep, it, it, it takes a while for you to wake up. But some people, you can just touch them, they wake up like that. And some people, they, they got to hit the alarm clock and hit it, snooze. Uh, yeah, some groups have been on snooze for 25 years. Yeah. So I don't want a broad brush, but again, there are some groups that, have, that understand that we are stronger together as a collective. We are stronger together when we understand the whole language and the nomenclature of justice. We're not talking about taking away people's cars and putting them on uh, MARTA or putting them on, here's BART. Uh, <laughs> we, we're talking about a justice, a system where people have access to opportunity. And if transportation is one of those justice issues, it is, then we need to fight hard to make sure we have just, uh, uh, clean, efficient, accessible transportation for people who don't have cars. And we need to make sure that we move in that direction of leaving no community behind when we talk about renewable energy. Let's not talk about, you know, um, this gentrification of energy and climate and all of that, where, where we talk about this uh, moving away from uh, dirty coal and what's left of the 12 dirtiest coal plants, they call them the dirty dozen, 75% of the residents who live within a, a two-mile radius of the dirtiest of the dirtiest of the 12 are people of color. 75%. Now, let's talk about having renewable energy in a green energy economy that leaves no community behind, and especially those communities that have been left behind for decades. That's right. That needs to be, we talk about the Green New Deal, and, and let's not have 
the old deal, like the new deal in the 30s, left behind lots of people. And a lot of those people look like me <laughs> and look like you in yeah. terms of race being somehow not addressed in the old new deal. Yeah. And so we have to understand history. I'm a sociologist, but I am a strong student of history. And we have to learn from, from history and not repeat it and make sure that we have all of our disciplines. That's why we need historians and journalists and humanities brought into this conversation. We need artists who can paint those big murals and those videographers who can make those punchy videos. And a lot of that's happening right now. Young people is doing that. If you're just joining us, Dr. Robert Buller is Distinguished Professor of Urban Planning and Environmental Policy at Texas Southern University, and Adriana Quintero is Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion with the Energy Foundation. I'm Greg Dalton. Adriana Quintero, the Green New Deal is this aspirational thing that's out there that you know a lot of people probably couldn't quite define, but, I, but it stirred quite a debate, and I think that the inclusion of some of the justice and economic issues that Dr. Bullard's talking about scares some liberals. It makes them uncomfortable because they think they're going to lose some of their privilege, some of their wealth. Is that fair? I think that's fair. I think that's why it stirred so much debate. But to quote again what Dr. Bullard said earlier, the Green New Deal was came on the scene with a big bang because of the intersectionality that it presented. And it really brought to light the reality that we can no longer think of the environment as one bucket that just sits alone in this silo. No, it has to do with transportation, it has to do with housing, it has to do with jobs, it has to do with health. All of these things are tied directly to our environment, to where we live, to our opportunities. And the, the, there is absolutely no threat to thinking of it that way. That's actually how we break this logjam that we've had and, and frankly take the, the energy out of the, the others who debate whether or not environmentalism is something that's important. When we start to show the connection to every single part of our lives, it's, unde it's undeniable. So anyone who is nervous about this particular piece of legislation just needs to look at how it's energized the conversation. It has sparked debate like no other piece of policy has, at least, in, again, in my lifetime in this movement. And, and I think that is where we need to be. We need to start talking about solutions that actually benefit everybody and benefit all the aspects of our lives. Because if we continue to, to silo environment, we're gonna lose a lot of people, and it's just not realistic. And the people who are gonna be most impacted are communities of color, which, you know, we were just talking about the, 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 the insanity behind excluding communities. When you look at the polling behind communities of color, at, by every single time we've looked at it, the support that exists for climate policies, the awareness of the fact that climate change is happening is so much higher among communities of color. And when you're looking at Latinos, when you're talking about Spanish-speaking only communities, then it's even higher. And, and so why wouldn't we take advantage of the fact that even if you wanted to just be brass tax database, that's the top, that's a ton of people. And it's the same thing when you look at the people who are energized by the Green New Deal. There's millions of people who would have never stepped into this space had that not come on the scene. So that energy, to me, is what we need much more of. And we need to continue to generate that and, and have that, um, these new and innovative ideas. They might seem scary to some, but it's just because change is, you know, makes us a little nervous. And you know what? That's a good thing. That means we're growing. Dr. Bullard, a lot of the, quote, mainstream environmental efforts have been funded by people who basically want to keep the economic and class structure in place, and they're worried that their house in the woods might burn down or their, their house on the ocean might get flooded, and they want to keep things the same and kind of swap out fossils for clean, but they don't want to tackle some of these deeper racial and structural issues. Is that fair? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the long and short of it is, is that um, I think the time has passed for tinkering and around the edges. Um, the fact that we are facing uh, a threat um, in terms of climate change and global warming that, that, um, 
that it will call for bold action and bold um, decisions that that will need to be made across the board and economic, political, um, in terms of our transportation systems and in terms of our energy systems, in terms of, of our housing, in terms of land use planning, in terms of all those things coming together. So it's not just, you know, when we talk about solutions, you just can't have, you know, a few policymakers sitting in a room who've all been trained in one little area, uh, who went to the same school, who may not understand anything what's going on the ground in a community uh, where they've, ne they've flown over it, 30,000 feet, and every at 30,000 feet, everything looks small, mm -hmm. looks great. You can't see the gr granular kind of thing. So, 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 so we need to really think through this whole idea of keeping things as they are. Right now in Houston, Texas, fourth largest city in the country, only major city that doesn't have zoning, we're fighting like hell to make sure that the recovery does not, post-Harvey recovery, does not reproduce the pre-Harvey Harvey inequality. We don't want to rebuild on inequality and, and make it like it was because like it was, was unequal. It took a biblical flood mm -hmm. to get environmental groups, mostly white groups in Houston, to come together with groups of environmental justice groups, of faith-based groups, groups working on transportation and, and food security, et cetera, to come together. And we say it should not take a disaster for us to come together. But 2018 election was a blue wave in Houston. In t in, and the old guard was swept out. New guards came in. And the idea of building equity into way funding, building equity into the way that decisions are being made, having the right people who have been exposed to inequality for decades in charge, they can see that it makes a whole lot of sense to build out Housing, because housing affordability is a big issue. Transportation, a big issue. Access to jobs, uh, the issue around flooding, around issues around land use, planning, et cetera. All these things have to be dealt with and not just one issue of flood mitigation. So if we go with the old guard, they just want to do flood mitigation and they're gonna, money follows money, money follows power, money follows white. That's how it was done before. That's a formula that, that's, um, uh, that's shown and, and, and it, it comes out in study after study. With the cost-benefit analysis, you get money following where the most damage, the biggest homes, cost-benefit analysis will say, well, you put the money where the $800,000 homes are. Why should you invest in $80,000 houses uh, when it costs $40,000 to do whatever? They'll put the money over where the big homes are and, and the big homes, the neighborhoods of the big homes will get uh, we'll see their property values increase, whereas the communities of color will, will lose. They will lose out, study after study. And so what we say, let's not um, keep that policy in place that will push, that will marginalize community further down the economic ladder and at the same time move the more affluent at another, at another level, which they increase their, their home values and their quality of life their, their, their disaster preparedness and their resilience, et cetera, whereas you, you make poor communities even more marginalized. Now that's what we're fighting in Houston. We saw that you know, play out in New Orleans after Katrina. We're seeing it play out in disaster after disaster. We said that should not be. That's the wrong complexion for protection. That's the title of the book. But it's playing out right now. And we're fighting that. We're saying, but it took a flood of, as I said, biblical portion to get groups together who've never talked to each other, never met together. But because rich people were, were flooded, now they understand what we've been saying. When you don't protect the least in your society, you place everybody at risk. That's right. And so our thing is justice will say, let's do fairness, equity, and, and justice to make sure that we do not somehow say just because you live in a low-income neighborhood that you don't deserve to have a park, a grocery store, uh, and, and flood mitigation and flood protection. You don't deserve to have access to transportation. We say that's the equity part. That's the justice part that we build into a climate resilience plan, a sustainability plan, and, and, a, and a, afford, a housing affordability plan. All of that. 
And some people say, well, that's not dealing with uh, the problem of flooding. Well, it's flooding plus. Flooding plus. All the, all the, the, uh, the pollution chemical companies located on one side. And they're dealing with flooding of the, uh, on that side, but they're also dealing with chemical releases. Let's deal with the whole picture and not just somehow, just because your neighborhood flooded for the first time, now you just want to deal with one issue. The justice framing and the equity lens will say we need to address those legacy issues that somehow got swept under the rug or got somehow wiped off of the slate of policy. And that's what we're fighting for right now. And for someone who has tenure, I'm not shy. I'm not timid. <laughs> and at my age, I, I, I don't care what people say. <laughs> the, speaking of policy, the New York Times did an analysis of the recent presidential debate and which candidates mentioned uh, climate change. And Dr. Bullard, uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, of course, Tom Steyer mentioned climate change. Uh, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Andrew Yang did not mention climate change. Anything there that the, the, the candidates of color, it might have been the questions that they were asked, I don't know. Anything there, is it, is it the framing? Is anything there that's just one debate? But we're, what do you make of that? Well, that's a New York Times article, and that's, a, and that's just one data point. Right. Um, is it, is I don't know what to make of that. But this is what I will say, is that any candidate, that's a Democratic presidential candidate, that's not talking about climate change and that's not talking about environmental justice, uh, uh, you don't have a chance. Uh, because of the issue, these issues are right and they're in center in, in a voting block. Uh, that's very essential for the party. For example, that was a presidential candidate um, forum held in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. It was an environmental justice forum, right. and some candidates skipped it. Um, Elizabeth the, Warren was there, Cory Booker. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so the issue, and then there are other forums that were held in Atlanta where the issues were brought up. The, the, from my standpoint, and I only speak for one person, that's myself, um, is that it's more than just talking. And, you know, we should have, you know, uh, talk to talk and walk to walk. I'm more interested in those who are walking the walk, who are ready to stand with and for uh, initiatives that's going to address these issues and, and, and address it in a way, in a holistic way. If you have a plan on climate, but you don't have a plan to deal with education, to deal with uh, criminal justice systems, to deal with, because for us, it's connected. And if you run away from some of these issues because the issues are dealing with race, for example, we just had a um, seventh annual HBCU climate change conference in New Orleans um, last month. And we started our conference off with reparations. Now that scares a lot of people, reparations. We say no, reparations when it comes to not just the environment, but reparations for not just the pollution damage that has been then forced on African American communities, for example, but also the reparations that date back in terms of slavery and all the Jim Crow and da 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 da. Uh, the study that's being proposed in Congress, a study that people are opposed to the study. They're not talking about writing checks, they're talking about a study. And so we say reparations when it comes to um, slavery and when it comes to the environment, the damage, because we know damage and harm has been done. Study after study has shown the impact of communities living next to these refineries and chemical plants and the damage of pollution on, on, um, on the fetus and what happens when the kids are, you know, grow up, et cetera. So, so let's talk about reparations in a way that makes a whole lot of sense. And so we say we force the candidate to talk about reparations. There are some who don't want to talk about it. We, 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 we're saying, okay, your platform may be inadequate because you don't have a position on it. Uh, and, and then we say, we're, we're not saying you own slaves. We know nobody that's living today own any slaves. But there's a thing called white privilege and that you understand how white privilege and how racism and Jim Crow and, and discrimination has, has disenfranchised lots of people when it comes to access to opportunity. We say we want you to understand those issues and when it comes to education funding to deal with those issues. 
If you're just joining us, Dr. Robert Bullard is Distinguished Professor of Urban Planning and Environmental Policy at Texas Southern University, also joined by Adriana Quintero, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Energy Foundation. I'm Greg Dalton. We're going to go to our lightning round, where I'm going to ask a true or false question and then an association of our guests. Uh, true or false, Adriana Quintero, I have more implied racial bias than I probably realize. Absolutely true. Uh, Dr. Bullard, white people are often eager to prove to you they are not racist. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and they often are not even aware they're doing it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, some of my best friends are black. <laughs> <laughs> uh, true or false, Adriana Quintero, your supervisors at NRDC were well-intentioned and paternalistic. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Bullard, white organizations are comfortable being white. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and with the exception of those who, who subscribe to whom. <laughs> uh, okay, association. What's the first thing that comes into your mind when I mention this? Unfiltered, uh, just among us here. What's the first thing, Adriana Quintero, when I mention carbon offsets? Oh, wonkiness. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bullard, fracking. Oh, the other word. <laughs> <laughs> Rhymes with. <laughs> uh, Adriana Quintero, Marco Rubio. Oh, boy. How long do you have? No, no. <laughs> Do you know that at some point he actually used to talk about climate, but yeah. no, nope, he's wiped that clean off of his repertoire. All right, let's give them a round of getting through the, uh, <laughs> getting through the lightning round. <laughs> We're going to uh, invite your participation to the microphone back there. Please uh, briefly identify yourself with one comment or question. We have a few minutes left for questions, and then we will... Um, go on to the award uh, presentation. So if you have a question for either of our guests, you can briefly identify yourself uh, and then, um, seriously? Can we answer it all? <laughs> there we go, brave. We love first timers and young people and. Um, hi, my name is Summer Solstice Thomas. I'm an environmental studies major at Williams College. Um, and I have a question for either of you or both of you. Um, how do we, when looking at like chemical and municipal waste disposal and even like chemical production, how do we pursue justice? Because often when you fight a, a refinery or a dump out of your community, it's moved to another community or exported to a different country where it's, there's less regulations and it's less expensive to dispose of. So how do we find like true justice and not just equity? Like you were talking about just spreading the pollutants for everyone. Dr. Bullard, you wrote Dump It in Dixie? Yes, I did. Mm. Well, the, 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 it's, it's not uh, easy and it's not uh, complex. You know, the idea if a community or city produces the waste, it should figure out uh, how to deal with it and not export it. Um, in Houston, since that lawsuit was filed in 1979, Bean versus Southwest and Waste Management Corporation, not a single, land, not a single sanitary landfill uh, has been located in Houston since that lawsuit. And what that lawsuit did, it forced uh, uh, a city that doesn't have zoning, it forced white people to say, whoa, we've, we've run out of black communities to put landfills because we're gonna have a bunch of lawsuits. We must figure out a way to deal with our waste because we know uh, landfills are not compatible with white communities. And so they went to a very aggressive uh, waste minimization composting uh, program. And, um, and so the, the idea of reducing the, the amount of waste and extending the life of landfills and coming up with alternatives, et cetera, um, um, and the recycling. And I mean, this is a city that, that, uh, uh, that prided itself as unrestrained capitalism. Uh, meaning that laissez-faire, you could do anything you want, uh, now uh, has forced itself to come uh, with, with uh, uh, ordinances and regulations uh, that was forced upon them because of lawsuits. Uh, I am against, I'm a firmer, uh, I'm, uh, I don't think we need to be exporting waste. 
uh, and, and cross-boundary uh, waste trade. Uh, and again, uh, when we work on landfills and, and manage, waste management issues, uh, we, we don't say, oh, put it, send it over there. We work with communities that's the, over their communities and, and make, you know, make them aware of what the issues are. And so we've been able to slow down a lot of the, the sending it across the border and, and exporting the problem somewhere else uh, here in the U.S. as well as uh, uh, abroad. And the fact that, you know, with the, 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 the spat with China, um, in terms of the trade spat with China, you know, a lot of, uh, quote, recyclables and waste, now it's piling up here because China is saying no. That means it's forcing us to do something. And I think um, there's a major waste uh, place uh, generator in terms of computers and electronics uh, not far from here. Uh, next question, welcome. Hi, my name is Carter Brooks. I, I didn't have a question except... We needed one. So, uh, what I a lot of uh, you, you mentioned your home thing. A lot of well-meaning groups, communities, etc., of, of white people wanting to be more diverse are often trying to just bring people to them rather than learning to go out to those communities and find out what they need. So, I'd like either the guests to speak up about what more or what how we could promote a different way of thinking, so that that's the first thing we start thinking of about how we're going to go to those communities to find out what they need rather than pretend we need them in our anyway. To any any way you want to speak to that. And any run contera, a lot of times it's those predominantly white organizations going to communities of color saying, "We know what your problem is, and here's how we're <laughs> you should solve it." <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean I, that's exactly what we're trying to change. And I what I see happening now, which I think is why the tide is really starting to, to turn, is we're starting with race. We're having that conversation about race. Uh, if we don't start there, it becomes really easy to make a lot of assumptions and just kind of pat ourselves on the back. But when you start with race, you have to face your bias. You have to face those assumptions and you have to realize that Yes, especially if you're a white organization, predominantly white, that you don't have the answers, that you can't even begin to have the answers. So it really changes your stance from one that is paternalistic and all-knowing to a learning stance. And that's really hard for people, and it is absolutely essential. If you don't have that as your first step, I don't know how you really get to that openness. And that, that we have to develop a growth mindset around this, and, and we have not had that. Um, so it's, it's essential that we face our bias and talk about it and name racism and, and classism and privilege and all of these difficult conversations if we're really going to have a meaningful conversation and make change. And I'll just give a shout out. We had uh, Tom Steyer here a while back, and he he's did quite a lot of coalition building with communities of color on Prop 23 to defend California's cap and trade program. And he said, I used to think that communities of color, people of color would like join this. And now he thinks they're, they're actually leading this. Yeah. Um, let's go to our next question. Welcome. Uh, sure. Hi, my name is Kay. It's pretty much the same question, just more specific. Um, Climate One's audience is really white and same with the commonwealth club how does this organization bring more diversity here great question um you know it, it's certainly an establishment organization you know having programs like this there's all sorts of issues of getting people i think the the sometimes the commonwealth club name feels like ooh, that's downtown will i be comfortable there is that like all white men with leather wingtip chairs <laughs> um people have a certain perception right uh, of that name, and it used to be that 75 years ago, but now, you know, um, it's something I think we struggle with just as much as, as other organizations, having programs like this, um, and certainly spreading the word. Um, if you'd like to talk afterwards and you have some suggestions, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear them, because um, we kind of reflect the, um, we do a lot to, to, to have gender balance. We're pretty proud of the gender balance we have in our program. It's about 55, 45. Uh, it's less uh, balanced racially and ethnically. Um, so thanks for that question. Welcome. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. First of all, I want to thank Thank you, Dr. Robert Booth, for coming here as a graduate of Clark Atlanta University. Uh -huh. I've been following you for a number of years. Uh, and as a fellow sociologist. You call that stalking? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Uh, no, I'm not just everybody. No, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, <laughs> and as a fellow sociologist, like, I've been using like structure functionalism to really navigate 
this world and uh, was introduced to environmental justice when I was a graduate student at Indiana University. So very much just want to thank you for leaving the breadcrumbs for me to finally meet you face to face here. All right, brother. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so again, my name is Alexis Kiritz and I'm a clean energy and equity advocate here in San Francisco. And the question that I have for you is, in the face of utility power shutoffs and the impending earthquake that everybody keeps talking about, again, I'm from Indiana, so all of this is new to me. Um, <laughs> How do you suggest communities of color really frame the discussion around resiliency when understanding, like like you were saying, uh, we are not really at the head of these organizations. A lot of us come in as assistants or program managers and so on and so forth. A lot of this is new to us. So how can we really help frame the discussion, not only frame it, but really lead these movements within these institutions? Thank you. And we're out of time, so that, this will be our last question, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Bullard. Well, you know, I, I, I'll give my, my biased uh, opinion. I think the equity lens has to be applied across the board, where we talk about uh, the resilience concept, but also in terms of who's um, at the table, who's leading these issues. The equity starts at home. And um, that, that has to be something that's, uh, that's, uh, that's going to drive this whole process, making sure that you have uh, a diverse uh, pool of folks who are making decisions around how we're going to drive this, this, uh, this resilience uh, train. And, uh, and it can't be just the same people uh, all the time. And moving from one uh, uh, issue to the next issue, where we talk about, oh, well, sustainability, and then we talk about resilience, or oh, then we're talking about, you know, the climate over here, and we're here we're talking about, you know, this issue over here. It has to come together, and that, that, uh, that cross-fertilization, that intersectionality, for me, is, is, will be key. And even though the resilience might be new to you on, on one area, there are other areas where, where you have lots of expertise, and you can bring that expertise into that room that's talking about resilience. Because you can't have a resilient uh, city if that city somehow keeps building on the inequality uh, and, 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 and somehow economic inequality, the racial inequality, the spatial inequality. I mean, those things have to be brought into the, the mix. And, uh, and, and sociologists are very good at that. <laughs> we, we have to uh, wrap it up. I'll just mention that the, you know, the Climate One logo is actually has its roots in that intersectionality of bringing together different spheres of thought, different people. That's what was the origin of, the, of that flowerly um, logo. After we close out the recording of the radio program, please remain in your seats and we'll have uh, Dr. Michael Mann come up here and present the award. And after Dr. Bullard, Bullard accepts the award, please join us out in the reception, in the foyer for a reception. And... Uh, we have some very distinguished scientists and change makers in the room tonight, so I hope you'll make a point to introduce yourself to someone you don't know and ask what they're doing, what they think about environmental justice. So please uh, meet some of the fabulous people we have here in the audience today. I'd like to invite you to join our uh, uh, Let's Talk Climate campaign. Take a photo with, uh, we have signs out there. Uh, Posted on social media, we believe that the climate change conversation begins with talking about it, uh, and then action follows that conversation. I get, have the honor and privilege of sitting up here with fabulous people like uh, Dr. Bullard and Adriana, but I want to give a shout out to the Climate One crew who makes uh, the, everything happen here. So let's give them a round for making uh, this a fabulous. Here, here. Um, We've been talking about climate justice and the relationship of fossil fuel extraction to racial and economic inequity. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guests were Dr. Robert Bullard, Distinguished Professor of Urban Planning and Environmental Policy at Texas Southern University. Today, Dr. Bullard received the $15,000 th Dr. $15, Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Communication, presented by Climate One. Also joining us, we had Adriana Quintero, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion with the Energy Foundation, which is distributes about $100 million in philanthropy a year. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you podcast. Please help us keep up the conversation going by giving us a rating or review. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time, everybody. So if you guys can have a seat, and then we'll ask you to come.
So while uh, we're doing a, a quick change here, I'll just mention the background of the, the Steven Schneider Award. In, in 2006, I did my first climate interview with Betsy Colbert, Elizabeth Colbert, who wrote uh, Field Notes from a Catastrophe, uh, and she's a writer at The New Yorker, still doing fabulous work. In 2007, I went to the Arctic with uh, scientists aboard an icebreaker and journalists and learned about climate change, walked on the tundra, uh, melting tundra, I was wearing a Hawaiian shirt, uh, and got steeped in the science, learned what albedo means, and uh, just really it changed my life. And, and I came back and I actually put together this slideshow and I sat at my kitchen table and, and cried for about two weeks, just kind of internalizing what I had seen and, and witnessed. It went from kind of an abstract idea to an experience. I wanted to learn more, so I went to Stanford and sat outside um, with, with Steve Schneider, who kind of, and uh, Patricia Mastandrea, who's here uh, every year, uh, joined us. And uh, Steve had kind of laid out and explained climate to me, like who's who and what's what. Um, and it was fabulous. In 2009, he came to Climate One to announce, uh, to launch his, his book, Science as a Contact Sport. Uh, and he gave a, a very memorable talk at Climate One. It was the first event he did uh, in 2009. And in 2010, um, he agreed to become the first member of the Climate One Advisory Council. I was very honored when such an esteemed scientist became the first advisor of Climate One, was very young. And then later that year, uh, he was going to come to Climate One after flying back from Europe. Um, we had Joe Rome, the fabulous blogger from Climate Progress, was going to be here that evening. And Steve wrote to me and said, look, I've been traveling too much. He was not in good health. I've, I've got to stop burning the candle on both ends and in the middle, too. Uh, a few days later, he, he died on the way back um, from Europe. And... You know, I didn't know until Joe Rome told me about it, and th what that event for um, for Steve kind of turned into a, a tribute or a memory of him because he was supposed to be with us that night, and he passed away uh, on a plane. And so I went to some of Steve's friends and said, um, I want to create an award for him. I wasn't his student. Um, I didn't go to Stanford. I, did, I worked there and co-authored a book there. I didn't go, go to school there. Um, and uh, some of his friends greatly, gratefully uh, said, OK, you know, who are you, by the way? And <laughs> Um, so we created this award, and it's been going now for nine years, and we've had some fabulous, fabulous, uh, fabulous winners, um, and we're really proud of the way this, this award has, has been established and is respected now. And so in 2018, uh, Michael Mann was the recipient of the Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Communication. He's this distinguished professor of atmospheric science at Penn State. Um, very much in the spirit of Steve, he's, he doesn't uh, walk away from a fight. In fact, he starts lots of them. Um, <laughs> he's suing the National Review for de defamation, a, a suit that was recently allowed to go forward by the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, so he's going to present the award. So please welcome Michael Mann, Mr. Hockey Stick. Well, thank you very much, uh, Greg. Uh, it is truly an honor for me to be in a position to present to one of my heroes uh, an award that recognizes uh, another uh, of my heroes, the legacy of another of my heroes, uh, Steve Schneider. So today we are here to present the uh, Stephen H. Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication. Steve Schneider was one of the founding fathers of climate science, having made seminal contributions to in areas of climate modeling, climate impact analysis, risk assessment, but Steve was also a masterful science communicator. And he served as an ambassador for the climate science community when it came to communicating the science and its implications to the public and policymakers. His fearless and tireless efforts to go up against the forces of denial and delay as he informed the larger public discourse over climate change inspired a whole generation of uh, climate scientists, myself included, to boldly go where no scientists had gone before, uh, leaving the comforts of the laboratory and uh, joining the rough and tumble arena of policy informative public communication. I consider myself privileged to have known Steve uh, as both a mentor and a friend. The Schneider Award recognizes a natural or social scientist who has made fundamental contributions to advancing our understanding of climate change and its societal implications and has communicated that knowledge to the public and policymakers in a clear and compelling fashion. I cannot think of anyone 
who better captures the spirit of this award than Dr. Robert Bullard. Often described as the father of environmental justice, uh, Dr. Bullard is distinguished professor of Texas Southern University, at, at Texas uh, Southern University, author of a number of seminal books on the topic of environmental justice, known for his work highlighting how minority communities are disproportionately impacted by pollution, and known for his efforts to raise awareness, as we've heard already, about environmental racism. Well, as was uh, discussed earlier, environmental justice is now at the very center of our uh, public discourse over climate change. Um, it undergirds the, the Green New Deal. Um, and uh, as Bob already mentioned, uh, he, I, I don't think he foresaw that um, his work would become quite this central to the, you know, to, to the discussion. And it's really moved the whole window of discourse, in my view. Uh, whether you, know, you, you like the Green New Deal or, or not in its current form, what it's done is it's moved the entire window of discourse, and you're actually starting to see conservatives come to the table. Um, and so it's really opened up the conversation. And as, as Bob and uh, others mentioned, it's brought a whole uh, new community of people um, into this discussion. Now, I first met Bob when we were both featured speakers at Penn Futures Creating a Climate for Justice Conference in Pittsburgh a decade ago on April 30th, uh, 2010. I'd been very much looking forward to this opportunity to meet and get to know the father of environmental justice. But I had some distractions to deal with. This was just months after the pseudo scandal that came to be known as ClimateGate. Um, and outside the convention center were a small number of paid protesters dressed as chickens and carrying signs mocking climate science and my work in particular. Parked out in front was a bus with a poster draped over the side featuring a hand-drawn image of me and a hockey stick bearing the insignia man-made warming. That's man with two N's. Uh, outside, employees of the Commonwealth Foundation, not to be confused with the, uh, uh, the, the Commonwealth Club. Um, it's a pressure group in Pennsylvania uh, tied to the right-wing SCAFE foundations. Well, they were handing out small hockey sticks and t-shirts that were emblazoned with that same phrase. So now 10 years later, I'm finally getting an opportunity uh, not to just meet Bob, but indeed to honor him under somewhat more pleasant circumstances. <laughs> so congratulations, Dr. Bullard, for this well-earned accolade. No chicken, this guy. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to thank Climate One. I'm a man of very few words. <laughs> no speech. <laughs> I'm really honored. And uh, I accept this award uh, on behalf of the work. And it's, uh, it's been a, a, a long time doing this work. And I tell. Uh, my students and I, I say, you know, the fight for justice is no sprint. Uh, it's a race that doesn't exist. It's a marathon relay. And you run your 26 miles and you pass the baton off to the next generation to run that 26. That's what the fight for climate justice, environmental justice, and health justice, and all the justice that we need uh, right now. And I think, um, you know, to be honored, you know, uh, in terms of, of dealing with climate and communication, I have tried to uh, speak English in a very plain way. When I write, I try to write uh, so that it's understandable, not to confuse, but to make it clear. And I think um, it's, it's important that social scientists uh, are able to communicate with the natural and physical scientists and, and, and deal with this very complex issue and have us all in the room 
working together for the common good. And that's what my, uh, my career has, has always been about. And uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Climate One for this, uh, uh, for this award. It's heavy, too. <laughs> You're going to have to mail this, because I don't think I can take it on the plane. <laughs> they would say this is a weapon. <laughs> Again, thank you very much. So we'd like to invite you to join us uh, in the foyer for a reception, but I do want to invite, uh, there's a juror, former juror, Ben Santra, to come up here and join us for a photograph with Mike Mann and Adriana, and I think I saw Chris Field also walk in. So um, we're just going to take a little photo to commemorate uh, these august people. Come on up, Adriana, Ben, and Chris former winner.